we are uh, continuing in the series that we're doing this summer called We Believe, which is based off of our statement of faith as the Evangelical Free Church. And uh, just to recap why we're doing them. What defines us as the church is our shared beliefs in who God is and who we are as a result of that. And up to this point in time, we've really focused in on who is God. We've talked about, um, we spent four weeks on our first statement of faith, which um, specifically talks about uh, the person of, of, of the, the Trinity and, and kind of who God is in general. We've talked about what we believe about Scripture and how that informs what we believe about God and ourselves. We've talked about the human condition, so kind of who we are. But that human condition really kind of focuses a lot more on who we are apart from Christ. And then we talked about the person and the work of Jesus. And then last week we talked about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to focus on who we are as the church. So this is the who God is. And now who are we because of who God is? Who are we as God's people? What defines us as God's people? And then in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about because we're God's people, how should we live to show that to the world? So, like I said, we're looking at the statement of faith in the Evangelical Free Church, um, and, and it's an essentialistic statement, meaning it's focused on the essentials of what it means to be a Christian. It's not getting off into, well, how do we do this? How do we do that? It's, it's, it's basic, it's general, it's, it's 10,000 feet kind of um, looking at, at, at Christian belief without diving into, into how do we understand every single little thing because that's where we get into the, well, I might understand something that, different than you did, do. That doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong, or it certainly doesn't mean we can't have fellowship together. And the reason we're looking at these essentialistic things is because when we center on those essentials, it keeps us united in God's truth. It's when we are not centered on essentials that we start getting off and, and, and have other things kind of define us, and we don't want to do that today. So we talk about who we are as the church, and we see how unbelievably important that is. So with that in mind, we're going to um, pray, we're going to dive into God's word for us today. Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would be present in the midst of your people today, and that you would lead us and teach us and guide us to all truth through your spirit that we have access to because of the person and the work of Jesus. Be present in this place. Speak your truth and give us ears to hear it. Give us minds to comprehend it. Give us hearts to be transformed. Give us hands to be quick, to be set about your work. Help us to lay everything else aside and come before you right now. In Jesus' name. So we're on Article 7 of our 10 Articles of our Statement of Faith. We'll be wrapping this up, Lord willing, the first uh, Sunday of September. And this article says, We believe that the true church comprises all who have been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone. They are united by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, of which he is the head. The true church is manifest in local churches whose membership should be composed only of believers. The Lord Jesus mandated two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which visibly and tangibly express the gospel. They are not the means of salvation. When, uh, though they are not the means of salvation, when celebrated by the church in genuine faith, these ordinances confirm and nourish the believer. And you might say, I don't understand some of That's okay. That's what we're going to talk about today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clarify what we mean by the church. Because there are three ways that we use the term church in modern English language. The first way is this idea of the church, capital T, capital C. Uh, it means the universal collective of God's people. We'll, we'll define in a few minutes here what we mean by what makes you part of God's people. But when we say the church, we don't just mean what you know. We don't just mean us here. We mean like Christians around the world, the church collectively, throughout all time and all places, the church. Um, we use it that way. We use it to talk about the local manifestation of that universal collective. That is the local congregation. We're we're the church. That's us. 
as a people. We are collected together in Christ's name, and we could say, oh, we're the church at Estes Brook. There's, you know, there's a church, and there's churches in Foley, there's churches, okay? Um, we, we use that, too. And then there's the third way we use it, which is the building in which that, the local manifestation meets. So this, we say, oh, this is the church, and we mean the building, right? We use it kind of in those three major ways. I hate to say this, but actually, of the three of them, the one that is probably most commonly used is which one? One, two, or three? Three. Ironically, it's only the first two that actually are in Scripture. The third ch term, the church as a building, is not once used in Scripture. The Bible never uses the term church to describe a location. It always uses it to describe God's people. It's about the community, either locally or universally. It's never used to describe a building. There are, by the way, the term church, um, and we'll get into this in a second, but the term church is used in both the Old and the New Testament, depending on the translation you use. Um, but they kind of have the same meaning in both places. It's used much more frequently in the New Testament, and you'll see why in just a moment. So you'll notice in our statement of faith, it says the true church is, uh, consists of or compri is comprised of. The reason that terminology is used is because this has been an issue within Christendom, uh, within Christian history for pretty much from its inception, but especially from the Protestant Reformation forward. So here's the question. Who is the church? If the church is a who, not a where, who is the church? That's, that's an excellent question that, that um, has been a, a sticking point in a, a place that people have wrestled for a long time. In the New Testament, the word that is used for church is the word ecclesia, or ecclesia, you'll hear it sometimes pronounced. And it literally means um, those who have been called out. The ek means out of, and the ecclesia means those who are called. The term church is a reference to those who have been called out. That's what it means. It is those who have found their identity in person, in the person and work of Jesus, and have been called out of the world and into Christ. It's sometimes used in the Old Testament. Some Old Testament translators choose to use the word church to refer to the gathering of God's people. Uh, for instance, if you read in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, some translations choose to translate the word congregation as church. And though that is completely a legitimate use of that, um, it, it's not, it, it means, it just means the gathering of God's people. That gathering can happen in a single location, but it also can mean just God's people in general. The, the church, therefore, because it's not about a building, and, I, and, and I, I need to really emphasize this, the reason the term tr true church comes up in church history so frequently, enough that it's in almost um, in every statement of faith, practically, um, a Protestant statement of faith, since the Protestant Reformation, is because, um, not because of just something that happened in history that doesn't happen today, but something that authentically happens today. Are we the church because we're gathered in this building? No, we are not. We are the church if we are God's people. We are gathered as the church in this particular place in this particular time. But you can be gathered in a church building and not be part of the church. You can be here and not actually have a relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ that makes you actually part of the church. Likewise, you can not gather in a church building and still be the church. You can gather in people's homes. You can you know, be sitting around the dinner table with your family who are believers. That's still the church gathering. And because of that, throughout history, we have made a distinction to say, when we say the church, we mean, what we mean by this, how we're defining this, is the true church are those who really know Jesus. Not just the people that gathered on Sunday morning, because that, that's the assumption that everybody in this room really knows Jesus. And that might not be the case. But also, that excludes those who aren't gathered with us that might be part of our, 
part of our community. The way scripture defines the church, it consists of everyone who has been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone. What we mean by that is a couple of things. First of all, we're going to look at this in Philippians. This is uh, Paul in Philippians. There's a ton of scripture you can look at about this. But this is Paul from Philippians chapter 3. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul is saying, listen, I don't have any righteousness of my own. I have no right standing with God. I have nothing good that I can claim before God and say, hey, I should be one of yours because of look at, look at me, I'm, I'm pretty good. Paul is saying, I consider my good stuff garbage, rubbish. As I consider it trash when I compare it to the, the great the righteousness that I can have in Christ. The righteousness that is the right standing that we have in Jesus. Scripture says time and time and time and time and time again that the only way we can have a relationship with God and be included in his family, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, is through faith in Jesus and Jesus only. And so you'll notice our statement of faith says through faith alone in Christ alone. Let's start backwards with that. Why Christ alone? Because we're acknowledging that Christ only can save us. Only the work of Jesus can save us. Not our own work and not the work of anyone else. Only Jesus can save us. It is essential to be a Christian to believe that. And along with that, it's only my faith in Christ that that makes that come alive in me. And as much as that seems like this strange metaphysical thing, it's, it's not as much as we probably think it is. What we are saying when we say through, our, through faith alone and Christ alone, I'm saying I, I believe that what Jesus did and only what Jesus did can save me. In fact, I'm willing to bet my life on it. Literally. I'm willing to bet my eternity on that truth. That there's nothing I can do to add to the work of Christ. So I cannot say to God, yes, I believe in Jesus, but look at, and look at all this other stuff that I did for you. No, the other stuff doesn't matter. My only hope is Jesus. And when we build our life on that, we, as we talked about a few weeks ago, means that we become part of God's family. Another word for God's family is the church. We are those who are no longer defined by those relationships and the things that the world defines us by, but instead we're defined by our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We are now His people. We're His children. We've been justified. That's a fancy word to say that God treats us as if we never sinned. It is, means that we have been, it's actually that we're justified in righteousness. Just, uh, justification and righteousness are actually the same word in Greek, in the original language. To be righteous means to have right standing. To be justified means that you have the right to stand before the judge without condemnation easy way to remember it is justified it's just as if I have never sinned that's how God treats me even though I have my justification, my right standing is not based on me it's based on Jesus of him and his work and the church consists of everyone who has been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone everyone This actually makes the church both inclusive and exclusive. We live in a, in a world and a, a society that wants to be as inclusive as inclusive as we can be. And I think often Christians kind of bulk at that. And say, oh, we don't want that. We don't want to include everybody. And the reality is scripture actually demands that we include everybody. 
in, in, in a certain way, but also that we are exclusive in, in what it means to be part of the church. What we mean by inclusive is that the church includes anyone, regardless of their gender, race, age, socioeconomic position, place of origin, anything. Anything that the world would use to define us, the church is anyone from any of those groups. The church does not consist of only, you know, white European descended people. It doesn't consist of only the rich or only the poor. It doesn't consist of only Jews. It doesn't consist of only Gentiles or only Germans or only Swedes or only... It doesn't consist of any of those things. It consists of people from all of those groups. In other words, there is no requirement to... There is none of those worldly requirements to become part of the church. To be part of the church is, however, exclusive because it requires us to claim Jesus alone as our source of salvation in relationship with God. So, like, we're not going to say, listen, you can be part of the church. Oh, you don't believe in Jesus? It's okay. We welcome everybody. Hey, we welcome everybody. But just be clear, you might be gathered here and say, I don't know that I believe in Jesus. And you're welcome to be here gathered with those of us who do. But from a tech, I mean, but just so you know, you're not actually part of the church in, in the biblical sense of that word. You're not part of God's family yet. But God wants you to be part of this family. Where we cross over from being the church, not the church to the church, is when we put our faith in Christ. And nothing else besides that matters. And you might say, okay, that's pretty obvious if you think about things. But I want you to understand that the early church struggled with this concept unbelievably so. The early church really struggled with this concept of can those who are not Jewish be really God's people? Because that's how they defined what it meant to be God's people. Well, you have to be Jewish. You have to be a descendant of Abraham. But ironically, God actually says, not everyone who's a descendant of Abraham is really my people. That would be this equivalent of saying, not everyone who sits in a, in a service on Sunday morning is really a Christian. So you have to actually have faith in me, trust me. That hasn't changed. Throughout church history, this is actually one of the things that we've struggled with the most. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, and I wish that this statistic has changed, but it has not, that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of our week in the United States. And it's because even as God's people, we don't gather with other people who aren't like us. That's not what the church is supposed to look like. It's supposed to, the church is supposed to look like wherever we're at, we have people in our community that don't look like us, they should be represented in our church because we're reaching up for Christ. That's what it's supposed to be like. That's what the early church looked like at every turn. And it caused problems. It was actually really, it was very hard for them to do that. But God said it was unbelievably important that they do that. So we are both inclusive. The church is both inclusive and exclusive. And it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that the church actually acts as, as what we call the body of Christ. This is one of those terms that, um, that, that the New Testament authors use often to describe God's people, the body of Christ. And if you don't really think about this, I, I, I'll be honest, for the longest time when I first became a Christian and I heard the term body of Christ, I was like, okay, I, I, don't, I didn't think much of it. Because we use the term body to refer to a lot of different things, Right? Like, we'll say, like, the, the body of Congress was gathered, which is a weird term. But we use that. And what it means is all of them were there. All the people that belong to Congress. That is not what this means. The body of Christ literally means Jesus' physical body. Now, Jesus has a physical body, right? Because he became human, he has a physical body. He's in heaven right now with a physical body. But when Jesus ascended back into heaven, he told his disciples, by extension us, 
I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you so that you can be my physical representation on earth. You guys will act as my hands and my feet and my mouth. You will be the ones that will represent me physically on earth. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. We are Jesus' physical representation on earth. And I know I've said this before, but this is where you hear expressions like there are four, five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you. And you are the only one that most people will ever read. The Gospel is a declaration of who Jesus is. That is who we are called to be as the church. We are supposed to represent Jesus to the world. We don't do that on our own. We do that because the Holy Spirit of Christ is alive and active inside of us. We talked about that last week. We do this as the Spirit brings unity to God's people. When we don't look like the world around us, not just because of our actions, but because we actually say we love everybody even if they don't look like us, even if they don't think completely like us, even if we, we, we accept you wherever you're coming from, and, and the Holy Spirit brings unity, that is a testament to the world of the power of God. Like I said, the early church struggled with this tremendously. Paul puts it this way, for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink with one spirit. In other words, he says, listen, what makes you the church, what makes you God's people, is not what's going on in the outside, it's what's going on in the inside. You all have the same spirit of God that inside of you. That makes you one. That makes you one. You have one mission, you have one spirit, you have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You're one. That's not our work. That's God's work in us. And this is acted out as Jesus acts as, as the church's head. And the term head is actually used in two different ways in the New Testament to describe Jesus' role with the church. It means both it's that Jesus is the church's leader, like the head of the church. He's the, he's the one in charge. But it also means source. Like when we say, uh, well, the headwaters of the Mississippi, that's like a task. Right? It's the headwaters. What, what does that mean? It's the source of the river. It's where the river gets its origin, its, its, its start. It's the life of the, of the river, right? Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in every way into him who is the head to Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul uses that image in both ways here. He says Jesus is the one that is in charge. The head is one that tells the body what to do, right? I don't know if you know this. You can live without an arm. You can live without an eye. You can live without a foot. Or two feet. You live without a nose. You live without a lot of stuff, but you can't live without a head. What happens when you cut a chicken's head off? It usually dies. Now, on occasion, you're like, oh, it's running around still. It's not alive. That's just, it's just, honestly, that is a perfect example of who we are as the church sometimes. We're like a chicken. Sometimes we have our head attached and we're, you know, eating what we should eat and doing what we should do and producing eggs like we should. And other times we have our head cut off and we're running around but we're dead. We're doing a lot of actions, a lot of activity, but there's no life in us. Jesus is supposed to be the, the source of the church where it finds its power, but he's also the one that is its leader. My wife loves this joke. She says, you, you know, she said, uh, this is, I think this is stolen from my big that Greek wedding. You know, the man is the head of the house. What does that mean? He's not the source of the house. He's the, he's the leader of the house. And she says, yes. And the wife is the neck. She turns the head whichever way it needs to go. She loves that quote. That's, that's not true. I asked her. She said it wasn't true. So that's, that's not true. Jesus is the head. He is the leader. But he's also the one that gives He's the one that we do 
We are the church because of Jesus. And as the true church, the way the true church, universal, capital T, capital C, the way the true church is shown is how it works locally. The local church is us. It's us gathered together in Christ's name to do the work of Jesus. That's us. That's We are the church if we're doing that. By the way, are we the only manifestation of the local church? Are there other Christian groups that gather together in Christ's name to do the work of the ministry? Yes. Do they all have to have the same little title at the end of the name? Yeah, well, you know, we have other churches around. There's the Malacca Evangelical Free Church. And there's the Princeton Evangelical Free Church. So we have two other churches. Around. No. There's all kinds of churches around us, right? They could have the name Baptist after them. Or they could not have a name at all. They could have the name Lutheran after them. <gasps> could they? Could they even have the name Catholic? Possibly, yeah. The church is represented locally by lots of different groups. Actually, that's been the case from the very beginning. I think we have this false sense that even in the early days of the church, when the church was springing up in a city like Ephesus, we were like, okay, well, they had one church. There was like 500 or 600 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 people in Ephesus that were Christians, and they all gathered together in somebody's house. No, they didn't. They gathered together in hundreds of homes. But they were still one church because they had one spirit dwelling in them all. They had one Christ who was the head of them all. They had one mission which was the same. And yet even in that, different God places different congregations in different places to, to work that mission out in different ways, to reach different groups of people, to minister in different kinds of ways because of the giftedness he's given them. And there's even seasons for all of that. It's not ever always going to be the same thing. But our statement of faith says that the local church's membership should be comprised only of those who truly find their identity in Jesus. So we're going to talk about what does that mean for a second. What do we mean by membership? Well, um, as some of you are, are, are well aware of, the, the idea of, of membership, like you go through a class and, and, and you get vetted and you do different things and then you become a, a voting member of a church, you're not going to find that in Scripture. It doesn't appear in Scripture. That wasn't the case. But because of, for societal reasons, honestly, um, and, and a couple of just human nature reasons, throughout history, the churches had to go through a process of vetting of those who might attend a local congregation to see, are you really part of the true church? Because if you're going to be in leadership or if you're going to have some kind of you know, say in the ministry of the church, you, you, we want to make sure you're really actually a Christian, that you really know Jesus. And that is what this is about. And you might say, well, you know, obviously I'm here, I'm a Christian. It doesn't mean anything. You can attend church your whole life and not know Jesus. And so churches have, have historically come up with ways of kind of vetting people to say, we want to know you. We want to hear your, your testimony. Know how you came to know Christ. See how God is at work in your life. Make sure that we're on the same page theologically about this kind of stuff. So that when we do ministry together, we know that we're doing it together through the Spirit of God and not we're on the same, we're on the same page. Now you might say, why wasn't that kind of laid out in the early days of, of the early church? And I'll give you the short answer is because um, people weren't jumping up and down in the community saying, I want to be a part of the church. Because being a part of the church probably meant you would, get, you would suffer and maybe die. It wasn't an issue. Like people weren't jumping up and down to say they were a Christian if they really weren't. Because to be a Christian meant you were going to suffer. People weren't volunteering for that. But as the church kind of morphed and became more socially acceptable and societally acceptable, you had more and more people that started going to church because it's what you do. It was a way to, you know, fit in in your community. Um, it's, oh, I go to church because my family always went to church. But you notice how I'm using the word church. 
It's somewhere I go. It's maybe something I do. It's not who I am. And so we want to make sure as God's people, as the true church, as we are on mission for Christ, that those of us who are actually, that we actually know Jesus, that is important, that, that the church is actually, the leadership of the church, the, the voting members of the local congregation, things like that, those who are, are serving in certain capacities, that we know that they really know Jesus. Because by definition, we can't be a part of the body of Christ if we don't really know Jesus. Imagine that. How can you be a hand, let's say, to use that analogy, we're the body of Christ, we're the physical elements of Jesus' body. Jesus is the head, but I'm a detached hand. I don't, I'm not really a part of the body. I show up on Sunday morning, and I hang out with everyone else as part of the body, but I'm not attached to the head. Am I going to do what the head tells me to do? No. Why? Because I'm not part of the body. I'm not really a part of the body. It's when we know Christ that literally he fuses us onto his body. We become a part of who he is. And that's extremely important. The other aspect to this local manifestation of the church is how do we Kind of uh, every every group of people in the world have rights. When I say rights, I don't mean R I G H T S. Not like you know, I have the right to do this, or I don't mean that. I mean right, like R I T E, like a right of passage, right? You know, um, if you're if you're Jewish and you're, you turn 13, you go through this celebration. Ceremony to become part of the covenant community. If you're a boy, it's called a bar mitzvah, it means son of the covenant. If you're a girl, it's called a bat mitzvah, it means daughter of the covenant. You go through this, this rite. You have to read scripture in Hebrew, and you have to, you know, out of memory, and you have to do different things. And it's kind of like your, your rite of passage. You become part of the community. The question is, do we as the church have those kind of rites? And the Evangelical Free Church, along with, I would say universally, the church universally would say, yes, there are two of them. Other groups might say there's more than two, but all of them would include these two. Okay? So what we mean by, and we call, we call that ordinances. And ordinance is practices that Jesus calls on us to engage in based on our, on our identity. The term ordinance I know that's kind of a strange thing because we hear the word ordinance and you're like, is that like a rule? Like you gotta know, obey the ordinances. No, it, it means actually something um, something to be ordained. It means that you're called to do it. So an ordinance is something that Jesus calls us to do. And, um, and these practices are things that we do because we belong to Jesus. They're not means of attaining God's favor or salvation. They're not what the, uh, our Catholics would call them um, these things, sacraments. We don't call them that for a reason. A sacrament li literally means something that makes you holy. It's something that you do to gain God's favor. They call them means of grace. Like somehow by doing this thing, God will like me more. That's not what we mean because that is not what Scripture teaches. What we mean is there are things that we do because by doing them, they declare our faith and they strengthen our faith. They strengthen our faith as we engage in these practices and they declare it to those around us as we do it as well. Because they are demonstrations of the gospel, of the, pers the person and the work of Jesus. And those two things are first, baptism. Baptism is the de declaration of one's inclusion and identity in Christ through the symbolism of death and resurrection enacted with water. By the way, I didn't look that definition up. I wrote it out and then I read it 15 times and I was like, I feel like that's really wordy, but I don't know how else to say that. Baptism is it, it's something that we do when we have a relationship with Jesus and we want to declare it to the world. 
Sometimes baptism happens the like we, we, we put our faith in Christ and we're baptized immediately. That is, that can happen. In the New Testament, that was actually the most common thing that would happen. It didn't always happen, but it was the most common thing. And, and there's other times that baptism is something that we do maybe after we've known Christ for a while and we say, I want, I want this. It is not a means of salvation. You do not have to be baptized in water to be saved. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. I mentioned this before. Jesus never baptized anybody in water. You have to have the Holy Spirit, but you don't. The water is a symbol. Now, when I say symbol, I don't want us to hear just a symbol. It is a powerful symbol. It is something that we are called to do. I do believe that every Christian should be baptized. I believe we should. I don't believe it is necessary for us to be baptized in order for us to be saved, because it's not a means of salvation. However, we should be baptized. Why? Because Jesus calls on us to. He tells us, believe and be baptized. Again and again in the New Testament that it's a call. That, but it's something that we should do as a believer. In other words, it's not something we do to become believers. It's something we do as a response to our faith in Christ, in Christ our new identity. And the image of baptism is the image of death and resurrection. It's the image of when you go into the water. By the way, the whole, like, which, which way should you be baptized? Should it be by immersion? Can you sprinkle water? Can you pour it on somebody's head? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. But that being said, I think the most impactful way is immersion. And I say that because it is the way that, is, that was practiced in the New Testament. And it, it kind of better captures the imagery of baptism. But if, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why that, that I, I'm not, I don't think we should be hard and fast on that in just a second. But the image of baptism is literally this image of we, we go into the water, so imagine you're going to get immersed. You're standing in the water, and this is you before baptism. And then you get baptized, and the water represents the grave. Literally, actually, Jesus' grave, too. And now you are included, in, you are symbolically included in Christ's death. And then you come out of the tomb just like Jesus did. And now you are included in Christ in his new life. It is the symbolism of saying, I want to die with Christ to be raised to new life with Christ. That's what baptism is. How many of you knew that? That that's what baptism represents, death and resurrection. Actually, the word baptizo, which is where we get this from, um, it's actually the term that was used in the ancient world for a sunken ship, which, which would sink, let's like, say, in the Mediterranean Sea or something like that. And it was like, it's unsalvageable. It's not, we're not going to pull it back up. It's done. It's now part of the ocean. It's just part of the sea. It's just, it's not, you know, like the Titanic. Think about the Titanic. The Titanic is part of the Atlantic Sea now, or the Atlantic Ocean now, right? It's just part of the North Atlantic. Like, we could go and drench it up, and I, I don't know what value that would be. Really? Like, it's now probably mostly a reef that's used by wildlife. If a, sink ships, uh, a ship sinks in shallow enough water, or even deep water, it becomes part of the, the floor of the ocean. Animals are living in it. It's just claimed. It's, that's what it is. It loses its old identity and becomes part of the ocean. That term is baptizo. It has been baptized. Which is why... That's the symbol of the New Testament. Just like that ship, my identity has been lost in Christ. When you see me, I hope you see Jesus. There's no distinction. That's, that's what I want. That's what we desire. Paul says it this way. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He says, when you when you were baptized, you, you were baptized into the death of Christ. When you're buried with Jesus, the old you is gone. It's dead. It's in the grave. Leave it there. And walk 
feel that newness when you come out of that water. Walk in that newness. Now, I said, our, our statement of faith doesn't say anything about you should be baptized with immersion. Immersion, it doesn't say you have to be baptized. It says that it is a means of declaring our, our faith to those around us. And nourishing us. I've been baptized twice. I just want to make sure it's stuck. No. Uh, I was baptized I was baptized as an infant. I, um, I didn't really grow up in the church, but my... My grandmother, my mom, or my dad's mother, um, had just enough kind of growing up in the church in her that when we were kids, she was like, you really should get the kids baptized. And my mom grew up Catholic. My dad kind of semi-grew up kind of sort of Lutheran. Um, and they kind of went to Grace Lutheran Church in Hibbing. And when I was a kid, when I was a baby, um, my grandmother apparently convinced my parents that my sisters and I needed to be baptized as infants, because that's the Catholic tradition, or the, uh, the, the Lutheran tradition. And so, um, and they have a very different view of what they mean by infant baptism. That's not something that we as a congregation espouse, but that's, that's another conversation. Um, so I was baptized as an infant, and I didn't even know that. I came to Christ when I was 17, and when I was 18, um, my one of my best friends, Jake, uh, his his grandparents attended First or, uh, Grace Lutheran Church in Hibbing. And they were doing BBS and they needed help. And so my friend Jake was going to help and he was like, hey, you want to help with BBS? And I was like, um, yeah, I went to BBS as a kid. I remember I remember stale graham crackers and, and watered down Kool-Aid. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, that's what, and, and felt puppets. That's what I remember from BBS as a kid. Um, I was like, sure, I'll come and help. And while we were there, the, the church secretary was taking down her names for stuff or whatever, and she said, Starnes, I know that name. And on the second day we were there, she came up to me and she said, you were baptized here. And she pulled up this baptism certificate. And I was like, really? I had no clue. Which is exactly what it meant to me. Absolutely nothing. I didn't even know. And then um, I said I came to Christ when I was 17. When I was 20, oh, I think I was 23. 23 or 24. I was 23. When I was 23, um, I was serving a church in North Minneapolis uh, in, a, in a lay ministry position. And I was on a leadership retreat. And we were reading through scripture and we are reading in the Gospels and Jesus talking about baptism. And I pulled aside the pastor who was leading the church retreat, a guy that I knew well and just loved as a brother in Christ. And I said, I've never been baptized. I mean, I was as a kid, but it didn't mean anything. I want to be baptized. Can we do that? And he was like, now? I'm like, well, there's a lake. Can we do it? And he was like, it's October, man. It's late October, and we're in northern Wisconsin. And I'm like, okay. And he said, no, man, we'll do it. So that afternoon, surrounded by the public leaders that were on the retreat, and some of the staff, we walked out of the lake. And I remember very distinctly what he said to me. The same thing that I said to anyone else when I baptized them. He said, there will be moments in your life where you will, where you will question whether God is real, whether your faith is real, whether, whether any of this is real. But right now, in this moment, you know it's real. This is your stake in the ground. This is your declaration to God and to everyone else that you belong to Jesus and that you don't mean it. And it was crazy. <laughs> but it was exactly what it meant to me. It was something that I decided I wanted because of what God, who God is in my life. I didn't do it because I thought that somehow God would love me more. I did it because I love Him. And it has been exactly that in my life. Because I've had those moments where I'm like, is this real? And literally, as soon as I say, like, is this real, I remember that cold water and it's circling my body. And I get holy ghost bumps, goosebumps all over me. God just says, it's real. Remember? That's what baptism is. It is a declaration of our inclusion in Christ. It is for our benefit, but it's also for the benefit of those around us. Because when you're baptized into, into Christ in a community, part of what you're also saying is, 
I want to live for Christ now. And I'm asking you to help me do it. That's why you don't get baptized, you know, secretly. Just I'm going to go baptize myself. I'll be back in a couple. You don't do that. It's always in community. And there's a reason it's in community, because it's part of what it means to be the church. The church is, by definition, community. The second of those ordinances is the Lord's Supper, or communion. This is a remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, symbolized by the consumption of bread and wine to represent his body and blood. You notice that little asterisk by wine there. We don't use wine, we use grape juice, in case anybody struggles with alcohol or anything like that. It's, it's symbolic, again. And again, just like baptism, I don't want you to hear sim- symbolic or it's a symbol say it's just a symbol. It doesn't really mean anything. No, symbols are extremely powerful tools. Taking communion doesn't make God love us more. It's not a means of grace. But it is a way to, to declare our faith in the person of the Lord of Jesus. It is sacrifice on our behalf. And it is a declaration to those around us that, that Jesus died for them too. We take, unlike baptism, baptism is a one-time thing. You know, maybe maybe twice. <laughs> But baptism is meant to be a one-time thing. The Lord's Supper is supposed to be something that we do on occasion because we need that reminder of Christ's sacrifice. It's actually based off the Passover Seder meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples the night he was arrested, what we call the Last Supper. And at some point in time, we'll go through kind of how, how the Seder fits into what Jesus did. But it's, it's, it wasn't Jesus introducing or celebrating something that didn't already exist. He was taking something that already existed that they knew about and saying, let me show you how I fulfill every promise God has made. And when we celebrate communion, it is meant to nourish our faith. Not because we believe we're physically eating the body and blood of Christ, by the way, that would be against God's own rules. We're not supposed to consume blood and we're not supposed to eat other people. Scripture says that very clearly. But instead, we, it's, it's a symbol of saying, I want to, I am cons- I'm consuming this as a, as a way of reminding me of Christ's sacrifice, but also that I want to be consumed by God. I want to be, I want to, again, find my identity in Jesus. And we call it communion because we, it gives us a community, a union with God and with one another. Communion, just like baptism, is something that we do together as the body of Christ, not individually. This is from the Gospel of Mark. Um, one of the four instances of, of tellings of, of the Last Supper. It says, as they were eating, he, that's Jesus, took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, the, take this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. It's based off of that meal that we celebrate with communion. So, so what? Well, first, we are the church... We are truly the church if we find our identity in Jesus. That's what makes us the church. Not because we gather together on a Sunday morning in a building someplace. Not because we sing certain songs or because we read from a certain book. It's because we find our identity in Jesus. That's what makes us the church. So my question for us is, does that define you? I can't say that does that define us unless I mean all of us individually. I want to make that clear. Does that define you? Do you find your identity in Christ? And if the answer to that is no, then today's the day to start that. You become a part of the church when you find your identity in Christ. That's what makes us the church. Starting next week, we are going to actually start looking at how do we live out being in the church. This week has really been more on what makes us the church. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to focus in on how do we live out 
being the church. And as we've been doing, instead of having a meditation verse, I'm going to ask us all to stand right now and we're going to read this state, uh, article of our statement of faith as a declaration of what we believe about the church. Why don't you read this with me? We believe that the true church comprises all who have been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone. They are united by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, of which he is the head. The true church is manifest in local churches whose membership should be composed only of the members. The Lord Jesus mandated two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which visibly and tangibly express the gospel. Though they are not means of salvation, when celebrated by the church in genuine faith, these ordinances confirm and nourish 